Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Julie Steck, and I'm a psychologist with CRG Children's Resource Group. And I want to thank you all for taking the time to join us today to discuss anxiety disorders in individuals with developmental disabilities. I'm really excited. This is our first CRG webinar. Uh, CRG has been around for a long time, and we've always wanted to be provide uh, good information to parents, to teachers, to other mental health providers about working with children. And we've done live seminars, and years ago someone said, you need to start doing teleseminars. And I couldn't even imagine how we might do that. So it's wonderful to have the technology to do it. And we look forward to providing more of these in the future. For those of you who have not done a webinar before, we are using the GoToWebinar platform. Um, you will only be able to hear me talk today, not hear each other. Uh, but you may ask questions through the question uh, option on your control panel. If you are having problems or need further information, you may also use the chat feature. Uh, that will allow Angela Beard and Jessica Rumpel, um, our two practice administrators who are here in the room with me to respond to your needs. Uh, there is a copy, a PDF copy of the PowerPoint available to you that you should be able to download in the handout section. We've had inquiries from many of you about receiving continuing ed for this seminar. Um, we are able to offer um, a certificate of attendance to everyone who's here. Um, while CRG is uh, eligible to provide Category 1 continuing ed units for mental health providers, this will only be a Category 2 continuing education uh, opportunity. But we will provide you with a certificate of attendance so that you may use it to uh, verify your attendance today. Uh, we will be uh, stopping about 10 to 15 minutes before 1 o'clock to take questions and uh, respond to, to any needs you have. So with that, I'm going to cancel out uh, my live performance and turn you over to the PowerPoint. So today we're going to be addressing anxiety in individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, and so if I can get the uh, PowerPoint to change. So this is the first of four uh, of four polls that we're going to take today. And um, you all may answer this uh, by uh, pressing on your screen. I want to know what your primary role is uh, in dealing with people with developmental disabilities. So if you can respond now, uh, the poll is in progress, and we'll find out who's in the audience today. So it looks like about half of you have responded. We'll keep the poll open a few minutes. And then we'll find out who's in our audience today. OK. So today we have, uh, of our audience, we heard from 88% of you. 37% uh, of you are mental health professionals who work with individuals with developmental disabilities. Uh, 31% of you are educators. 17% of you are direct service providers, and 14% of you are parents of an individual with a developmental disability. So I'm going to close out that poll. Um, and for some reason, my PowerPoint's not wanting to go. So as always, we, we do want to talk about our goals as a result of attending today. We hope that you will be able to identify three common behaviors or symptoms of anxiety in those with developmental disabilities, uh, list three strategies for lessening anxiety in those with developmental disabilities, and recognize approaches for treatment 
of anxiety in individuals with developmental disabilities. So let's talk about what anxiety is. Um, I think most everyone has experienced anxiety at some point in their life, either chronically or for short periods of time. But anxiety is excessive worry, irrational fears, discomfort with others looking at us, stomach aches and bowel problems, other physical symptoms of stress like headaches, pounding heart, perfectionism, panic, compulsive and repetitive behaviors. And uh, now we're going to see a little YouTube video about anxiety. Um, I hope this works for everyone and this uh, can be found on YouTube, but I think it's a pretty good explanation of what happens in the brain. Welcome to the short tutorial on your brain on anxiety and stress. It is essential to know how our brain responds to the stimuli which trigger an anxiety response so that you are equipped to deal appropriately with anxiety. Let me highlight the key areas of your brain that are involved and then I will explain what happens inside the brain. The thalamus is the central hub for sights and sounds. The thalamus breaks down incoming visual cues by size, shape and colour auditory cues by volume and distance, and then signals the cortex. The cortex then gives raw sights and sounds meaning, enabling you to be conscious of what you are seeing and hearing. And I'll mention here that the prefrontal cortex is vital to turning off the anxiety response once the threat is passed. The amygdala is the emotional core of the brain. Its primary role is to trigger the fear response. Information passing through the image is associated with an emotional significance. The bed nucleus of the stria terminals is particularly interesting when we discuss anxiety. While the amygdala sets off an immediate burst of fear, the BMST perpetuates the fear response, causing longer term unease typical of anxiety. The locus ceruleus receives signals from the amygdala and initiates the classic anxiety response. Rapid heartbeat, increased blood pressure, sweating and pupil dilation. The hippocampus is your memory center, storing raw information from the senses, along with emotional baggage attached to the data by the amygdala. Now we know these key parts, what happens when we are anxious, stressed or fearful? Anxiety, stress and of course fear are triggered primarily through your senses. Sight and sound are first processed by the thalamus, filtering incoming cues and sent directly to the amygdala or to the cortex. Smell and touch go directly to the amygdala, bypassing the thalamus altogether. This is why smells often evoke very powerful memories. Any cues from your incoming senses that are associated with a threat in the amygdala, whether that threat is real or not, current or not, are immediately processed to trigger the fear response. This is the expressway. It happens before you consciously feel the fear. The hypothalamus and pituitary gland cause the adrenal glands to pump out high levels of the stress hormone cortisol. Too much cortisol short circuits the cells of the hippocampus, making it difficult to organize the memory of a trauma or a stressful experience. Memories lose context and become fragmented. The body's sympathetic nervous system shifts into overdrive, causing the heart to beat faster blood pressure to rise and lungs to hyperventilate. Perspiration increases and the skin's nerve endings tingle, causing goosebumps. Your senses become hyper alert, freezing you momentarily as you drink in every detail. Adrenaline floods to the muscles, preparing you to fight or run away. The brain shifts focus from digestion to focus on the potential dangers, sometimes causing evacuation of the digestive tracts through urination, defecation or vomiting. Heck, if you're about to be eaten as someone else's dinner, why bother digesting your own? Only after the fear response has been activated does the conscious mind kick in. Some sensory information takes a more thoughtful route from the thalamus to the cortex. The cortex decides whether the sensory information warrants a fear response. If the fear is a genuine threat in space and time, the cortex signals the amygdala to continue being on alert. Fear is a good, useful response essential to survive. However, anxiety is a fear of something that cannot be located 
in space at a time. Most often, it is that indefinable something, triggered initially by something real that you sense, but that in itself is not threatened, but it is associated with a fear. And the bad nucleus of the sphere terminal will perpetuate that fear response. Anxiety is a real fear response for the individual feeling anxious. And anxiety can be debilitating for the sufferer. Now that you know how anxiety happens in, in your brain, you can pay attention to how we can deliberately use the prefrontal cortex to turn off an inappropriate anxiety response once a threat is. Well, I hope that helped you make uh, have an understanding of what happens in the brain with anxiety. And one of the things I want to point out is that uh, the speaker talks a lot about how we use the prefrontal cortex to help manage anxiety. And as most of you know, the prefrontal cortex for those with um, with developmental disorders does not always work as efficiently even when they're not under stress. So today we'll be talking about the ways we can help and assist with managing anxiety. So how common are anxiety disorders? Well, let's look at the statistics of anxiety disorders in the, in the general population. So these statistics are not uh, related the, to those just with neurodevelopmental disorders, but with for the general population. 25% of the general population of adolescents between 13 and 18 will have an anxiety disorder. That's a very high percentage. That's higher than the in, incidence of attention deficit disorder. Um, it's higher than most other uh, I think all other psychiatric conditions. 5.9% of the general population of adolescents will have a severe anxiety disorder, severe enough that it interferes with functioning, functioning at school, functioning at home, functioning with peers. 30% of the general population of females, now this is um, not just um, adolescents, but all females, versus 20% of males will have an anxiety disorder. I'm sorry, this is during adolescence. So much more common in females than males. And about 18% of the general population of adults have anxiety in any given year. So anxiety disorders are very common in the general population. But it is much higher uh, and much more common in those with neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, so who is at risk? Um, clearly people with autism spectrum disorders are at a high risk for having anxiety disorders. Those with intellectual disabilities or cognitive disabilities, um, the, those are the same, mean the same thing. Blindness and low vision, um, deafness and hard of hearing, individuals with cerebral palsy, seizure disorders, and other neurological conditions are at higher risk for anxiety disorders. Those with learning disorders, particularly those with nonverbal learning disorders, are at high risk for anxiety. And individuals with ADHD are at higher risk for anxiety. So what does the research tell us about anxiety disorders in neurodevelopmental disorders? One, those with developmental disorders are at a higher risk for mental health disorders, all mental health disorders, than the normal population. So anytime we're dealing with individuals with developmental disorders, we should be assessing for co-occurring psychiatric or mental health conditions. Those with developmental disorders are likely to meet criteria for a mental health disorder for a longer period of time. So while anxiety tends to ebb and flow in individuals without developmental disorders, 
um, those with developmental disorders tend to have the diagnosis for a longer period of time. And unfortunately, they are less likely to get treatment for mental health disorders than those in the normal population. Um, I've worked with individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders for 40 years as a teacher, a school psychologist, and for the past 30 plus as a psychologist. And I'm always surprised when I see um, a young adult with a neurodevelopmental disorder who has never seen a mental health professional. Um, because it's clear most of them will have mental health conditions. Okay, so now we're going to have our second poll. And uh, in this poll, we're going to ask you uh, how anxiety is demonstrated in those you work with. If I can find my poll. Hmm. Well, I'm not finding my poll. So um, I don't know why. So we may have to skip that poll. Um, do you all see it? Okay. So Angela uh, and Jessica are going to launch the poll. Okay. Did it launch? Okay. I can't see it. Okay, let's see how many of you have responded so far. Um, okay. Okay, so it looks like about uh, so far 83%, 88 have voted. So we'll go ahead and close the poll. Um, oh, so some of you still voting. Okay. And we'll close that poll. And so what we saw is that 33% of you said that the individuals you know or work with uh, pick their skin, nails, or hair. 31% become angry. Oh, those, those individuals, let it, they don't suffer in silence. We know when they're anxious. 21% refuse or shut down. 10% take flight or escape in some way. And 5% pace. Um, so I think I forgot to share that with you all, but now you should be able to see it. So, okay. So I think those of you who work with or live with individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders see the same things that I hear about in my practice. So in order to provide a framework for understanding and thinking about individuals with developmental disorders, what I want to do is kind of help us reshape our thinking. We used to think in boxes and we would say, what is it? What's the nature of the individual's difficulty? And for those of you who are educators, please know I say this a little tongue in cheek, but I think you'll agree that Article 7, which is special education, uh, Indiana special education law, is written in boxes. So we ask ourselves, what is it? Does this child or individual have autism spectrum disorder slash Asperger's, which we don't really use that term anymore, but I still refer to it. Do they have anxiety or do they have ADHD? But I think over the past 20 years, we've recognized that we need to think in Venn diagrams. We need to think in conditions overlapping. So I, over the years, I've seen a number of young people and young adults with autism spectrum disorders. And I would say the high, a very high percentage of those individuals, in addition to autism spectrum disorder, have anxiety and ADHD. So if we look beyond the primary diagnosis, we're going to get to the secondary parts of the condition for example, ADHD and anxiety, which are parts of the condition we can treat. It's very hard to treat autism spectrum disorder directly, um, but we can treat the
the comorbid parts like anxiety and ADHD. But I also think we have to think about the individual as we need to approach the individual in thinking like a Venn diagram. And so the relationship between family, school, and mental health needs to be overlapping as well. The same individual that you see in your office or the community at school also lives with a family and that same the same types of anxieties and behaviors are likely seen in all of the situations uh, they are um, participating in which they're participating. So most of us early on either in high school or college have learned about the normal curve for anxiety um, and so we've all seen the curve and we know that um, that if we um, you know if our anxiety is low we may not have our best performance but as anxiety increases we tend to put forth more effort we're more alert we're working harder and so we at some point in our anxiety curve we're going to perform our best but with too much anxiety we begin to experience stress and unhappiness and our performance declines. But I really like um, this curve for, oh I'm sorry, for though uh, when we think about those with developmental disorders. So um, this, is, this is a curve that looks at how we can intervene with individuals with developmental disorders. And, um, and so we think about this kind of five point scale. So at a one, when they're at a one is when we can best lay the foundation to help the individual as they're entering into a situation that may be difficult. This is where we build our relationship with the person, we pre-teach them the skills, and we prime them for a situation that may be difficult. When anxiety starts to increase, we may recognize that the person's starting to show us symptoms of anxiety, repeating things to themselves, breathing heavily, wanting to get up and leave the situation. Um, and this is where we can make adjustments to our expectations so that they can be successful. Once we get up to a three, the person's frontal lobe is shutting down and their thinking and reasoning and problem solving is decreasing. So at this point, we need to try to leave the anxiety pr producing situation if possible. Um, we need to, as adults, remain calm and help them get out of the situation so that they can return to problem solving. But by the time they get to a four, we can't ask them to do more, we can't ask them to make choices, we can't expect them to calm. Uh, by now they're agitated, maybe pushing their papers off the desk, um, starting to throw things. Um, so this is where we need to back down because by the time we get to a five, which is peak anxiety, we're not able to talk to them. We can't direct them or help problem solve. Our job then is just to help them to de-escalate. Um, so if we hear at a four, they may be starting to de-escalate, but if we put the challenge back in front of them, whether it's a paper or whether we give them their shoes to help them learn how to tie their shoelaces, we're probably, we could be in harm's way. Things could be thrown again. They can start to re-escalate. As we help them calm, we need to get them to a three and use encouraging supportive words, but not bring up the incident remain calm and then once we get down, back down to a one, that calm state, we may be able 
to talk about the incident and try to determine what interfered with functioning. So I think this curve is very helpful. I know a number of school districts will use the five-point scale. Uh, this is the basis for the five-point scale to help evaluate and help um, an individual evaluate how they're doing in a situation. Okay, so now I want to... So I thought we'd do a case study. I need to get rid of this pen here. Okay, so I have uh, we're going to do three case studies today, and none of these are actual individuals. Um, I've tried to combine attributes from very common cases and situations to use as examples. So first we're going to talk about Ben. Ben's a seven-year-old male. His parents are divorced, but both are very involved, and he is an only child. Uh, ben is eligible for special education as a student with a specific learning disability and reading. So for those of you who work in the schools, you know that Ben must have a pretty significant reading disorder to already be eligible as a student with a learning disability, and he does. In second grade, he's almost a non-reader. Um, He's been diagnosed with anxiety, depression, ADHD, and dyslexia, or that, that's the name of his specific learning disability, the reading, spelling, and writing disorder. He hates school and feels that the teachers and other students don't like him. Um, so um, at the time that he was initially seen, um, he was he was very depressed, not doing well at all. Um, so what did anxiety look like in Ben? Well, he would talk to himself in class, kind of mutter, talk under his breath. He was withdrawn and distracted. Um, in fact, Ben would tell me that he would look out the window and see a cat in the playground and then pretty soon he would see cats in in the classroom. Now he wasn't having hallucinations but his mind, his imagination would just take over. He would play alone at recess. He had difficulty getting started in the morning. He was confused at the end of the day and he was making very little progress in reading. So in Ben's case, now Ben was had had above average intelligence, so his frontal lobe would work a little better for problem solving. He was better able to communicate than some individuals with whom we work. But um, Ben could identify that he got confused the minute he walked into school, and he would get lost in the morning routine. Um, he couldn't get into his cubby well to store his his um, book bag or to get his homework out. And so he would start worrying about this even before he got to school. So once we found that out, the resource teacher was very agreeable to assisting him in setting up his locker differently and making a checklist to go on his desk. Um, ben didn't know who to play with at recess. He was depressed and he really thought people didn't like him. He had the power of negative thinking going big time. So uh, his teacher helped him identify groups and friends who might have common interests. Ben did, wasn't really into sports, so he was having a hard time locating other people who didn't play sports, particularly males. Um, so once he could identify friends who had his interests, he could go out to recess and, and relax and enjoy that downtime. And his parents were divorced, as I mentioned, and they rotated uh, every other day. So he had a different pick, parent picking him up every other day, and they were also picking him up in different locations at the school. So the parents were very agreeable uh, to posting a schedule so he knew which parent was picking him up, and they picked him up at the same location. So. In Ben's case, a few changes made a big difference. 
and I was just able to meet with his parents and school staff a couple of weeks ago, and while he still is struggling in reading, he had made some very nice progress, had friends, was confident, was ho happier in both he um, home settings, and was sleeping better. Um, now, we've got a ways to go on some of the other issues, but a few changes made a big difference for Ben. So now let's talk about Abby. Abby's a 12-year-old female with autism spectrum disorder and low average intellectual functioning. She's verbal. Um, she has two siblings near her age. Parents are divorced, but both actively involved in her care. I'm really not trying to pick on parents who are divorced, but I think it adds a different level of complexity for our indiv the individuals we have with ASD in that it means changing environments frequently. Um, Abby and her parents um, spend equal time with each parent, and they change homes every three to four days. She's fully included in general education, but struggles with completing work and following classroom instruction. Like Ben, she feels that she has few friends and that others don't like her. She had that power of negative thinking. So what did anxiety look like in Abby? Well, she was a pacer. So if she was stressed, she would get up during class, um, or in my office or wherever she is and she paces and she talks to herself um, she talks to herself both for pleasure and when stressed so she has a very active imaginary group of imaginary friends who she relies on and talks to um, she's not having hallucinations I I've certainly vetted that and feel very confident that she just lapses into her imaginary word, world when stressed. Um, she would feel or state that others are against her. She had stomach aches during the school day. The school nurse knew her well. She struggled in class and with completing her work. She wouldn't start work and she would sit alone during recess and lunch. So now we're going to do our next poll, um, and I want you all to kind of think about and give me some input about what are some strategies that you might use to decrease Abby's anxiety. So if you can let us know what your strategies would be. Uh, we've listed a few for you to, to consider. Okay. Okay, we're going to close the poll here in about five seconds. Okay, so 84% uh, of you, great, great feedback. Uh, provide her with a daily and weekly and monthly schedule. Um, I, I think as adults, we carry around our own schedule and we have that schedule in our head but we need to make it visual and available to individuals, probably all, all children and adolescents and young adults, uh, but particularly uh, those with developmental disorders. 58% of you said five ways to lessen the number of transitions. And that is, I think, a very great uh, thought. Um, it's sometimes hard to do until you gain the trust of the parents who are divorced and they recognize that you're not trying to enter into a custody 
uh, situation, but merely trying to help this, the student. Um, let's see. Seventy-one percent of you uh, said help Abby identify friends to sit with at lunch and play with at recess. Absolutely, individuals with, particularly with autism spectrum disorders, do not readily identify the other people that might share their interests. They tend to be able to pick out the other very popular or athletic individuals but not ones who would share their interests. So if we can help them identify friends. 32% um, said read assignments aloud, scribe, and um, I think this is also a very important accommodation within the school and with technology today we can also, we can often do that through technology. Um, and um, 16% said decrease the course load. Um, and I think that's a really important consideration um, even for individuals who have, and I always say just ADHD, um, that doesn't mean that's a benign condition, but um, too many balls in the air can be very stressful for individuals with any type of neurodevelopmental disorder, including um, including ADHD. Okay, moving on um, to Devin, who's a 22-year-old male. Um, he lives at home with parents and a high school sibling. He completed college with a great deal of family effort. Um, he has few friends. Um, and although he did graduate from college, he's not been able to hold a job. He was only recently diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder and is not very accepting of this diagnosis. Um, and his parents are just trying to come to grips with it. Uh, he stays up late at night and sleeps late in the morning. He does not readily shower, shave, or change his clothes. Uh, for those of you who work with young adults, um, you probably know Devin or someone that meets this description. So what does anxiety look like in Devon? How does it present? Well, he's very stubborn about trying new things. He can find a lot of reasons that can sound plausible about why he's not going to try something new, but it's usually just his anxiety about doing something new. He does not ask for help and resists advice. Um, one of the things that I comment on frequently to my colleagues is that um, people with autism spectrum disorder as well as some other developmental disorders don't know what they don't know. And if you don't know what you don't know, you don't ask for help and you don't take advice. Um, he prefers to do things on his computer to interact with others. So his friends are virtual friends. Um, he blames others on things not working out. He avoids the social aspects of a situation and does not initiate contact with others or make calls or send emails. Now, if you ask Devin if he had anxiety, he would say no. But this is what anxiety looks like in him. So now we're going to take another poll, and this will be our last poll. And um, what, we, what we're asking here is for you to identify any of the uh, items on the poll that would not be helpful to Devin. So what would not be helpful? Okay, we're going to close the poll here in about five seconds. Okay. 
Well, I agree with you all. The, the number one thing that I would say is not helpful is to lecture more. And when I'm working with parents, particularly parents of, you know, adolescents and young adults, um, the parents tend to want to explain and lecture a lot. And I find that's not very helpful. Uh, because after about the first three words of a lecture they've heard before, or even if they haven't heard before, they're going to tune it out. And um, I find that um, both mothers and fathers can lecture, uh, but fathers are really good at it. Um, so um, the other 28% uh, of you said it's not helpful to compare to siblings. And absolutely, I think these young people have compared themselves to their neurotypical siblings for years. We do not need to compare them to their siblings. I do find, I'm not sure about the sign up for an online dating course, I just, uh, service. I just put that on there to see what people thought. I tend to want the individuals with developmental disorders to learn to have real relationships um, before they have online or virtual relationships. They are much more comfortable with virtual relationships, but they need to learn how to have real relationships. But I do think it's very helpful for young adults with ADHD to have a job coach, not just the parents, um, and they need assistance with money management. So let's talk about treatment. What do we do about anxiety? We've talked about what it looks like, who's at risk for it, and now what do we do? Well, I think the first thing is that we need to recognize it. And we need, if you're going to um, treat it through therapy or medication, we need appropriate diagnosis. Even if an individual doesn't have a diagnosis, and you're a teacher or a direct service provider, you can be addressing it. But to get appropriate treatment, we need to have it across the board. We need it diagnosed. We need parent, caregiver, and teacher education about the conditions and related conditions. Um, one of the things that, for those of you who deal with families with uh, individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders, what I find often is that their child, um, the family's child, has gotten a diagnosis, but they've never really had a good understanding of how the condition impacts them. So I really think even if you are dealing with a teenager or young adult, take the time to step back and try to answer questions about the condition the individual has and how it impacts them. And as, as uh, the individual gets older, I talk with them about it. Um, talk with them about the difficulty they have with either using their working memory or when they're stressed, using their thinking. We need to adjust the expectations and the environment to meet the individual's needs. And while I, I think we want individuals with developmental disorders to be comfortable in our typical environments, we have to recognize that they aren't always comfortable and we may need to adjust. So as we treat those with neurodevelopmental disorders, we need to establish realistic expectations. Um, I saw a young man not too long ago that was nine. Um, his, he had a moderate intellectual disability, meaning that his intellectual functioning um, on IQ tests fell in the 40s to 50s. And of course, like everyone, all parents, you know, the family wanted him to achieve a high school diploma. Um, which meant he was remaining in general education classes throughout the day. Um, and while he wasn't causing behavioral difficulties, I think he was spending most of the time pretty much shut down 
and in his imaginary world. So we need to help families have expectations for their uh, child, adolescent, or young adult, but we have to help them be realistic. It's appropriate to think about individual and family therapy. Um, when I see uh, individuals with developmental disorders, um, technically we see it, we, it's coded or we talk about individual therapy, but a large amount of the time helps the family know how to help their individual. Um, so it, it needs to include both the individual as well as the family. Many times we see siblings as well so that they can become part of the solution and not part of the problem. We need to adapt environments, school, home, community to meet the individual's needs. We know that individuals with developmental disorders aren't always adaptable, uh, so we need to adapt for them. And there are times when we consider medication. Um, use of medication without all these other components will not be very effective. So medication doesn't mean you skip all the other parts of treatment. So what are our roles as adults, caregivers? Well, I think first of all, we need to downshift and keep our emotions calm. Um, as one of my colleagues, Dr. Jason Rowland, will frequently say, there's only room for one hand on the panic button. And we need to make sure that as adults, we stay calm to help the individual. We need to assume the role of the frontal lobe for the person with developmental disabilities when they're anxious. We need to help them think and problem solve at level one and two so that they don't escalate up to three, four, and five. We need to problem solve ourselves. What else can we do that might help alleviate anxiety and stress? And we need to implement those solutions. A great idea that's not implemented isn't very helpful. In general, we probably need to decrease expectations. That doesn't mean we don't have expectations, but if the young if the person with a neurodevelopmental disorder is displaying anxiety, that is not a time to increase expectations. It's a time to decrease. We need to decrease the stimuli, including less talk. For some reason, when people are stressed, we all want to talk more and explain. And actually, decreasing stimuli, both the visual or the noise or the number of people in an environment um, and talking less will help decrease anxiety. We need to increase support. Um, that doesn't always mean another person, but it means what are the supports we can put into place in any in situation that might help the person. Um, I. I neglected to say at the beginning that I've probably learned more about treating anxiety through the individuals in families I've worked with than any mental health conference. Um, and one family I know who does just a remarkable job with their 30-year-old uh, daughter who has uh, a moderate intellectual disability, um, one of the things I see them do is really front-loading everything they do for her so there's more support. So for example, if they take her to a party with them, which they often do, they pack a bag so that she has her coloring books and her iPad, and because oftentimes beer will be consumed, they bring a root beer for her with a straw, and they find a place where she can be comfortable and have something to do. So their increased support is not hiring a person to come along, but helping make sure that at the out front, outset, she's comfortable. Provide more clear visual support. 
I think as adults, we assume that once a person can talk, they don't need visuals. But individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders don't hang on to what they need to do when they need to do it well. And visual supports like calendars, timers, um, lists can help them a great deal. Provide the option to let the individual get out of a situation with dignity. Um, so when you think about that curve we looked at earlier, they need to be able to get out with dignity, dignity at a three before they have knocked over tables, broken computers, or hurt people. One time I sat in a case conference uh, with probably 10 adults and we were talking about a young girl in third grade um, who was on the autism spectrum and had um, below average intellectual functioning. And uh, when I walked out to, to go get a drink of water, she was pacing up and down in the hall, muttering too much, too fast. And those words have stayed with me. And I think what she was saying is her day is too much and too fast. So it makes me think, again, that we need to allow more time for daily routines. Um, individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders will take more time to get ready to do so something, more time to transition. We need, again, to talk less and listen more. We need to minimize transitions, provide visual prompts and schedules, decrease stimulation and stress, and find alter alternative ways to include but not to overstress. I think as we work with individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders, it's important to recognize that they have a different perspective often. Um, we need to recognize that the individual's needs and perspectives may not be the same as our own. We need to try to establish a routine that is fulfilling to the individual, but not overstimulating. And we need to make sure that the individual as well as the caregiver, is getting enough sleep, nutrition, and exercise. Um, because they are going, not going to be at their best and more inclined to be uh, anxious and non-compliant if they're tired, hungry, or don't feel well. So with that, I, I want to thank you all. Um, and I'm I do have a list of recommended readings that is in the, uh, in the handout. If you've been able to download the PowerPoint, I'll scroll through them quickly. Um, it's a long list, um, and, uh, but I think all of these have good information for those, those of you who deal with individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders. Um, I want to call um, particular attention, I think I have it on the list, um, that uh, to living in fear, um, anxiety in adolescents with autism spectrum disorders. Um, this is on the um, uh, Indiana uh, Developmental, the uh, IU website, and it's just excellent information. So with that, we're going to open it up to questions. Um, and um, if we have any. Okay. Okay. So one of the questions is, how do you distinguish between imagination and hallucination? Uh, it seems to me that these may be on a spectrum where imagination may morph into hallucinations. And I think you're absolutely right. Thank you for the person that asked that question. Um, so one of the things that, um, that I, again, I will go back to what we talked about early in this session, that individuals with develop, neurodevelopmental disorders are at a higher risk for uh, mental illness. And that does include the development of psychosis, um, whether it's from depression or bipolar disorder 
or a schizophrenic type of disorder. Um, so it is important to try to monitor that. I think you're right that there are times that what starts out as an imagination may morph into uh, may morph into more hallucinations, and it's kind of a um, it's it's kind of a um, something that you have to just keep an eye on. And if they're spending more time in their imagination and those start to exist outside of their head, then we start to be more concerned. And usually hallucinations will become, um, when we're really concerned, it's because they're scary hallucinations. Okay, um, no one's asking an, e an, an easy question today. So what is the difference or is there one between autism spectrum disorder and nonverbal learning disorder? Oh, this is an age-old question. Um, and some people think there isn't a difference. I happen to think there is. So people with nonverbal learning disorders on psychological testing, like an intelligence test or neuropsychological testing, will have deficits in visual, spatial, or what we call nonverbal processing. They have poor sense of direction. They don't put puzzles together well. They hate Legos. Um, they can memorize things very easily, but they don't um, think and reason as well. There are many people with nonverbal learning disorders who have anxiety but are very social, and, and they're socially driven, whereas those with Asperger's disorder may have nonverbal processing weakness, but they also have more severe deficits in social interaction. Um, if that's a topic that people are interested in, we certainly could consider um, doing a, a, a webinar on that because it is a question we get often. Another question, how do you distinguish between um, depression and anxiety in, in Devon? Well, that's a great question, and I think Devon does have both. Um, my my experience with individuals with autism spectrum disorders, particularly those that would be more what we call the Asperger's disorder, is that they typically have very flat affect, meaning it's hard to read their emotions. Um, they, you don't see them get excited and happy very often. Um, and so it's really kind of a fine line to know when they become depressed but almost always they're anxious. Um, so uh, I'm going to answer one more question. Are there any local support groups for one, young adults with NLD, uh, nonverbal learning disorders? And I would say I do not know of any, but if someone out there does and answers here in a, uh, uh, through chat or on our uh, answers with a question, I'll let you know. Um, Okay, okay, so question. What I meant was, what test did you give to distinguish? Okay, good question. So with Devin, we did, um, in his case, we did primarily um, projective testing because we actually wondered if he was having some thought disorder. And the projective testing, including the Rorschach and the TAT, um, revealed he did not endorse depression on checklists, but his were shock and TAT were significant uh, for, for depression and anxiety. So it's about time for us to end today, and I want to thank you all for being present. Um, and, um, and I want to remind you all that we do have two other webinars coming up. Uh, Dr. Sandy Burkhart will be talking about the do's and don'ts of talking with people on the autism spectrum disorder. That will be on Tuesday, June 21st. And Dr. David Parker, who's a post-secondary disability specialist and ADD and life coach, will be talking about the top 10 strategies for making a smooth transition to college. That will be on Wednesday, June 29th from noon to 1. Um, information about our seminars do go out in a constant contact 
blast. Um, they're also available on our website at www.childrensresourcegroup.com. If you want to sign up for that, uh, for constant contact that we deliver periodic announcements about webinars or groups and then our quarterly newsletter. We try not to bombard people with that. Um, you can sign up for constant contact on our website. Uh, I just got a question about if this will be able to be viewed later and yes it will. We will have it posted on our web, a link to it on our website we hope by the end of next week. Um, so I do want to thank you all today. I want to be respectful of your time and let you get back to what you need to do today. Um, I do have an answer. One other parent, I think a parent responded that she has a 23-year-old son and can't find a support group for nonverbal learning disorders uh, anywhere. So I would encourage you all, if you're looking for a support group, if you want to email us at, at uh, CRG at childrensresourcegroup.com and give us your contact information. If we get enough parents, we'll try to help you put one together. So again, I thank you for being with us today and hope you have a wonderful weekend. Stay cool. Uh, someone asked, is the PowerPoint available? Yes, it should be on your hand. If you look on your dashboard and it says handouts, um, you should be able to click on that and download it. It's in PDF form. And if you can't get it, we will post it on our website. Okay, he says he sees it. Thank you. Thanks to all of you and have a great day.